Morning and happy Sabbath. I would like to welcome church member and friend to the Thai Seventh-day Adventist virtual worship service. We are living in a very unusual time, unprecedented time, but praise God for we have this technology that make it possible for us to come together, to worship together, even though we are not together. The whole world is facing uncertainty and fear due to this invisible enemy, the COVID-19. I take comfort from the word of God, which is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Paul wrote to Timothy, his beloved son, whom he called, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I hope these words written over 2,000 years ago will resonate to all of you as they have with me. I have few announcements to make. Last Sabbath, Pastor Chris and Sister May had visited our church families. I was told they visited about 15 families with the help of Dr. Henry and Dr. Goy as their navigator. I would like to let you know that Pastor Chris wants to make it his goal to um, visit all the church family. And um, they want to do it as soon as they can. And um, so you will be receiving a call. Uh, we will, they will still be practicing social distance, wearing masks. Uh, you can meet them outside your front door, or if you feel comfortable, you can invite them to, uh, to go into their, your house. So may the Lord be with all of us as we come together and worship God together. Thank you. This morning is for church budget. Even though the church is closed, there's still expenses. And uh, I don't have a figure this morning, but I was told by the treasurer that in these few months, the uh, offering that come in had dropped quite a bit. But I'm certain that many of you are faithful to God and his work and this church. Because I received few calls from church members asking how can they send the offering into the church. So this morning, you, I will let you know that you can do it many ways. You can do it online, go to the adventistgiving.org or write a check to the Thai Seventh-day Adventist Church and mail it to Elder Sunder address. 11461 Hillcrest Street, Loma Linda, 92354. You can look up his address in our directory. And um, I know that uh, many of you have always been faithful 
and uh, you uh, want to see the church be able to uh, sustain during this hard time. Let us uh, bow our head as we pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your kindness, for your compassion, and for the truth that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for the mission of the Thai church. Even though during this difficult time, I know that this church will be able to sustain because of the faithful members, Lord. Thank you for all the donor donation that comes in, Lord. And I pray that you will bless these money so that we may work and advance your kingdom while we are here on this earth. And as we go into the divine service, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with each and every, every one of us, that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our hearts, Lord, that we will understand the word that comes from you, Lord, through Pastor Chris. Bless him, Lord, be with him and his family as they transition to be an, our new pastor, Lord. We are so thankful that you ha have answered our call, Lord, that you have answered our prayer. And thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My heart is so proud, my mind is so unfocused, I see the things you do through me, as great things I have done, and now you gently break me, then lovingly you take me, and hold me as my father. Mold me as my maker I ask you how many times will you pick me up When I keep on letting you down And each time I will fall short of your glory How far will forgiveness abound And you answer my child, I love you as long as you're seeking my face You'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace At times I may grow weak And feel a bit discouraged Knowing that someone Somewhere could do a better job For who am I to serve you? I know I don't deserve you And that's the part that burns in my heart And keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times will you pick me up? I keep on letting you down And each time I will fall short of your glory How far will forgiveness abound And you answer, my child, I love you And as long as you're seeking my face You'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace Was paid on Calvary. So 
instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me. I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down. Time I will fall short of your glory. How far will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the path of my daily sufficient grace. Amen. Good morning, church family. Today we will be accepting two uh, new church members, and they are joining our ch uh, church family, and we are so happy, we are glad. I know that heaven is glad with their decision as well, and we are so happy that they choose uh, the Thais Day Church um, to join and to uh, grow in their walk with God. So at this moment, I want to present to you um, Irma Mariscal. She is coming from Iglesia Adventista del Septimo Dia, Central Guayaquil, Ecuador. Okay, Irma, you mm -hmm. are there. And then uh, you want to say something, Irma, like one or two sentences? Oh, I am very glad to be part now of Thai Church. Yeah. It's a church family, yeah. Amen, amen. amen. And also, <laughs> amen. And also, I want to present to you Sister Audrey Hayon from Kota Kinabalu City, is the church, Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, Malaysia. Sister um, Audrey, we also want to welcome you the same as we welcome Sister Elma. You want to say something as well? Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for, um, like, having like taking care of me this you know since i got here and then um being so generous and warm and kind and i'm just happy to be like officially be a part of thai church <laughs> amen. Amen. amen amen okay so to formally welcome you um i need a motion from the church and we have our elders with us to support you in this outset of your uh, membership here in the thai church is there any motion from uh, from the church body with regards to their transfer of membership? I move that we accept Audrey and Irma to fellowship with us as church members. Elder Sunder made a motion. Is there any second to the motion? A second uh, motion uh, to accept Audrey and uh, Irma to our church. Okay, it was uh, moved and it was seconded. Those who are in favor say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Now, uh, Irma and Audrey, you will be members of the Thai Church. And with God's grace and with God's indwelling spirit in you and in us, we will journey together as we wait for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And also we would grow each other in faith and also we will be together in responding to the need of the community. We'll um, rest assured that we'll be praying for your um, progress and also help in, in all aspects of life. So God bless you all. Amen. 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 God bless you. Love God you bless all. bless you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> be before we end, I want to ask uh, Elder Sundar to please pray for us. Did you say pray? Okay. Yeah. Our Father in heaven, we are so blessed and so happy today that we can receive Audrey and Irma officially as our church members. They've been with us. We pray, Father, that they are joining our church will be a blessing 
to them as much as it is to us. We pray that you would guide and lead them and we will be able to support and encourage them to grow in your grace. We pray that your spirit will continue to be with them as you have been in a greater portion, that they may be a blessing and a support to enhance your work at Thai SDA Church. We thank you so much for this opportunity. May we use it for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Good morning, church. It is my privilege to stand before you again and lead you, breaking the spiritual bread of life. Last Sabbath, after the online installation ceremony, we visited some of you, and it was such a blessing and joy that we were able to visit you at your homes. We visited 16 homes last Saturday, and it was such a joy in our hearts. Coming out from those visits, I saw that many are facing degrees of difficulties, like many. Such is common to many, if not all. Now, you may still remember that my last two sermons had their focus on God. 
In the first message, I emphasized the unchanging nature of God, and in my second, I underscored the importance of God being the foundation of life and church. You might say, I already heard those concepts a hundred times, but so do I. But the Bible was written so that we will hear them throughout our lifetime. They are written to encourage us when we face specific circumstances in life. To put this in real perspective, there are 50, 52 weeks in a year. And let us say, out of 52 weeks, you have 25 weeks that are really great. And that's a good number. And then 15 weeks that are good. And then seven weeks that are so-so. And five weeks that you are really down. Church, I tell you that there are those weeks in which we are down or really down. Now, there are some that say the count is opposite sometimes. Our experience is the opposite of that. They have more troubled weeks than good or great weeks. Speaking of troubles, Jesus said, In this world, you will have trouble. Yes, there is trouble in this world, Jesus Christ said about it. In Matthew 6, 34, Jesus said, Each day has enough trouble of its own. It is not strange to experience troubles in life. Now, why we are studying this, studying this because troubles in life are potential moments that could discourage us in our walk with God. It shrinks our understanding about God and dims our hope in God. So, our understanding of God is so important as we battle life challenges and as we battle life changes. It is important to be refreshed with our understanding of God, especially looking at it in the context of our, of our suffering. And with that, you would need to hear the unchangeability of God's power and love to you, even in your changing circumstances. You need to hear that when God is the foundation of your life, you will never surrender and give up your faith. In our times today, trouble is everywhere. 2,000 years after Jesus said those words, in this world you will have trouble, it is still the same in our times today. This world is still what? Trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. We are still in this world that is trouble. The society is troubled. Many homes are troubled. Streets are troubled. And with the current situation, almost everyone is troubled. Jesus forewarned in Matthew 24, verse 8, And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Notice that when pestilences come, it is just the beginning of sorrow. If we are to believe Jesus' words, we are living in a path of time in a stubborn crisis like this that it will just linger for a short of period of time, but will persist and it will intensify. With the colossal magnitude of this crisis, with which the outcome couldn't be precisely calculated, yet this might just be the beginning of sorrow as we know it, looking at Jesus' words. However, in saying these words, it was not the intent of Jesus to scare his followers, but to prepare them. Again, it was not the intent of Jesus to scare his followers, but to prepare them. He forewarned that the world and the church will suffer impending and imminent crisis, crossing freely into the path of pain and sorrow. And that is what we are going through. Let me clarify that Jesus did not determine the crisis or pain to happen. It is not his intention. It is so contrary to a clear picture of a loving God if being our Father causes pain and struggle of his people. He did not cause you to lose your job due to the pestilence. He did not cause you to lose your health due to the pestilence. He did not cause you to lose your loved one due to the pandemic. Once you might have a satisfying career, well secured, but now gone. 
Once you might have a healthy body, but now gone weak. Or you are experiencing sickness in your life. Once you might have a fulfilling marriage, but now it is broken. Church, it is never intent, it is never the intent of God to hurt His people, but He doesn't deny the consequences of sin, which such consequences are utterly hurting. It is sin that creates havoc and misery and pain. The reality is we suffer because of our sins. If we are not to take care of a healthy habit, for example, it is hard to achieve a sound mind and a well-being. But sometimes we suffer because someone has committed sin, wrong, and mistakes on their own and we are the victims of their promiscuity. Like someone was hit by a car because the driver was driving under the influence. Sometimes we suffer because of the society, societal leaders' mis mis miscalculations and social and political policies with the occurrence of wars and many others. Well, it was not the intention of God for His people to suffer. In the beginning, thorns and thistles were not part of His creation. The falling leaves that dried up was not part of God's design. The sweat flowing from a human brow was not organic in human physique as God had designed. A mother's pain in giving birth it only came after sin entered. Yes, God's sovereign attribute can stop sin and its consequence, and yet He didn't. Let me repeat that. God's sovereign attribute, His power, can he stop sin and its consequence, and yet he didn't. He can stop you from experiencing troubles in life. He can stop you from suffering. He can do that. But God did not stop the flow of tears. But he allows it so eyes will get washed and see clearer the picture of God. God allows roses to have thorns so it could have protection against Predators. Falling leaves are necessary to give organic fertilizers to the ground. You might not know it. Sweat in human brows come out, comes out to benefit us in regulating body temperature, produces good mood, elimination of chemicals, and whatnot. A mother's pain is necessary to perhaps appreciate the preciousness of life. You know, when we go to sufferings and troubles and pains. It will only make us stronger. Someone said, Christians are like tea. Their real strength is not drawn out until they get into hot water. And that's true. When trouble comes, there is a reason. God did not send Goliath so that David will become a hero. But Goliath was necessary so David's faith will be magnified. God did not cause Job his suffering, but his suffering is needed for him to have a clearer view of God's sovereign power over all powers, even the power of Satan. God did not cause the drought during the time of Elijah, but it was necessary to call Israel back to God and for them to redirect their loyalty to God. He did not create the storm, but the storm came. So the disciples call on Jesus and witness his power above nature. God didn't send storms, but he allows them to come and uses them so that his power is manifested. There is importance to this thought that when we experience troubled life, when we are undergoing intense pain and suffering, that it is important for us to submit our life, our troubles, to the will of God. Even how strong or how longer we are in the practice of faith, maybe you are a practicing Seventh-day Adventist or a practicing Christian for 50 years or 30 or 20 years. It doesn't matter. Even how strong or how long we are in the practice of faith, 
when we are tested by a life-threatening, nerve-wracking situation, like a serious illness or any circumstance that rocks life, the realization of how mortal we are starts to dawn. Then we start to gasp for air and look for strength as our faith starts to tremble and shake. On the surface, trials and tests do not present any good, nor it is desirable. Jesus knew how terrible it is to go through trials. Remember, Jesus, cried, Jesus prayed while facing his incoming death. Father, if it, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Jesus prayed that God would not throw him into the pit of death. It was God's plan that Jesus would die, however, and he was fully aware of it. Plus the fact that Jesus knew the scripture very well. He quoted scripture many times, which means Jesus knew what the scripture said will be fulfilled concerning him. Moreover, from Matthew 16 to 20, Jesus spoke about his death and resurrection three times. So Jesus Christ knew the scripture that it will be fulfilled, that he will suffer and he will die. And Jesus Christ knew that he will die and he will come back to life again. He said it so many times. So why would he pray such a prayer, take this cup away from me? Was it not a very unusual prayer by Jesus? A possible answer to this question is, Jesus might have an exhaustive view of his suffering plus his victory and has a mindset of fully submitting himself to the will of God. And the plan as he was part was not dim and glory. It was so clear in his eyes, but he expressed the human's natural tendency and desire to avoid pain and suffering. Like us, no one would say, Lord, bring me to the point of suffering, and I will show how faithful I am to you. Everybody wants to get the blessing, but everyone wants to be excused from pain and suffering. But challenges are real, and we, if we are to call our name Christians, we are to readily suffer like him. It is just the nature of life and faith. Even Jesus was not immune to trouble, facing his impending crucifixion. Luke 22 verse 44 says, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. In the human aspect, when we are confronted with the greatest test, we do not ask the question, does God exist? Jesus Christ didn't ask that. Jesus believed in God. In fact, he knew the plan of God. He was the very essence of God in human form. Yet the Bible says he sweat dropped like a falling of blood when faced the reality of pain and suffering. Believing in God does not drive away sorrow and anguish. It is not the clear understanding of God's plan that keeps us from grief. Again, I repeat that. It is, not, it is not the clear understanding of God's plan that keeps us from grief. Remembering Jesus saying at the beginning of his ministry that he would die but will come back to life on the third day, John chapter 2, verse 19. But being in human nature, his sweat flowed like drops of blood when faced with grief, with the grief of death. The agony, the grief, or misery are as real due to suffering. When we suffer, there is always agony, pain, grief, and misery. It's just part, it is just outcome of that process. Any physical pain has its emotional counterpart, or any emotional pain has its equal physical impact. Peter, a tough guy, brush, khaki, you may say, a disciple of Jesus, denied his Lord when confronted by the prospect of suffering. In Matthew 26, verse 35, says, Math, But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. 
Yet, where are they when Jesus Christ carried his cross? Jesus Christ carried his cross alone, and Peter was never to be found. So combining Jesus' reaction to his impending suffering and Peter's denial of Jesus when suffering is not just a possibility but real, tells us that every human being will naturally respond to a real-life crisis with a life with a feeling of fear, worry, discouragement, trouble, and anxiety. I would say those are natural reactions of being human. I believe those are common responses to real-life crises. Your doctor calls you and he says calmly, it's cancer. The test came back, it shows you are COVID positive. You hear about a life-threatening diagnosis and it, and it scares you, and it scares you. You were set up with a termination meeting informing you of the reasons you would lose your job. Fear, worry, trouble, anxiety are common responses. However, having those responses is not an absence of faith. It is not an absence of faith. Remember that Jesus' sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground, even though Jesus never doubted God's plan and purpose. But look at Jesus' words. He said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Worry, trouble, anxiety are common human responses. But it is important that there is a total submission to God's will as you go through suffering. Now, how to submit yourself to God in the context of human suffering, fear, and worry? Here are five verses that I want to highlight. In John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. Trouble is real, but the antidote is believe in God and believe in Jesus. In Psalm 56, verse 3, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. When fear comes, let us put our trust in God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Leave all your worries with Him because He cares for you. So put all your worries in Him because He cares for you. Isaiah 35, verse 4, Tell everyone who is discouraged, Be strong and don't be afraid. God is coming to your rescue. In Psalm 94, verse 19, When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. And considering the context in which those verses are written, to submit yourself to the will of God means, first, to believe in Him and His abiding presence. Even though He's not with us, but in physical form, He is with us with His Spirit. So believe in Him and abide in Him. Abide and believe of His constant presence in your life, even knowing that in life we seem to be alone. That we are not alone in death. We seem to be hopeless, but God is our helper. We seem to be void of future, but Jesus is preparing a place for us. Second, to submit to the will of God means that when your enemy seems so great and, and many and powerful and has seeming advantage over you, and may hound you all day that you can trust in God to bring you relief and to put your hands to the hands of the living God, knowing He will deliver your soul and keep your feet from falling. Third, to submit to the will of God means to cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Thus, be humble before God, because He alone has the power to lift you up and keep you from falling. You may stumble but not fall, because God's hand is holding you. Fourth, submitting to the will of God means not to be discouraged. Be strong and do not be afraid. Fear not, because when conflict comes, and we, when you undergo conflicts in life, God assures you that He will be on your side. God is with His people, so fear not. The phrase, fear not, 
occurs several times in the book of Isaiah, encouraging God's people to fear not because God is on their side in the midst of their trials. Fifth, submitting to the will of God means that when you are anxious, you go to God because He is the place of refuge and safety, and His presence is the comfort of your soul. The Bible has many comeback stories. People failed, people suffered, people were in trouble, yet there are many comeback stories. And these people, they did not give up on God in the midst of their troubles and sufferings and probably mistakes in life. And because of that, God hold them up, even in their greatest crisis. They cling on to God and came out approved by God. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it presents great names, and these names are etched forever to the faith's hall of fame. Noah was rejected by his own generation. They laughed at his message. For 120 years, his message was not received by his people. Yet, he continued to trust God and followed his command. Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai rather than sticking to the promise of God, and he went to Hagar, causing family trouble that is stretched through many generations. Yet, Abraham bounced back and offered his son Isaac, depending on God's promise that God will provide, seeing in faith that generations after him will be blessed. Jacob had usurped the birthright and caused him trouble with his brother. It was a lonely life. It was a lonely journey, leaving his home. And by the time he approached the time of his death, the Bible says he worshipped God and he blessed his children. Joseph was sold by his brothers, yet was faithful to God. Moses, great as he was, had many troubles in life, lived in the desert for 40 years, tending the flock of his father-in-law, suggesting that at old age, at 80, he didn't have property to call his own. He lived the final years of his life in the desert, tending the flock of God in the, pe in the people of Israel. And then people rebelled against him, and they complained against him. He wasn't able to reach the promised land as we know, except that God allowed him to see the land before he died. Yet, when Christ appeared in the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses appeared at Jesus Christ's side. David committed sins after one after another, yet he trusted in God, and he was restored in God's sight. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was thrown in a pit, yet faithful to deliver God's message. Daniel continued to pray, even if it was against the royal law. It was a disobedience to the king's command, yet he was faithful to God, and God protected him. In the New Testament, Levi Matthew and Zacchaeus, notorious tax collectors, were despised by their communities, yet Jesus restored them before God. You remember two brothers, James and John, they attempted to covet the highest place and honor in Jesus' kingdom, which caused the other disciples to be angry at them, but both of them were rectified. Peter denied Christ, but was fully reinstated by Jesus. Unfortunately, Judas gave up on God, but God tried to rescue him. But he just plainly gave up his hope of restoration. He died and wasted his time spent with Jesus and lost his hope of eternal life. You remember Paul. He was the chief among sinners, as what he said. Yet he planted churches throughout Asia and finished his faith and remained faithful to him. Above all, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the author and finisher of our faith. 
He is our great high priest, our savior, our model, our example when facing the greatest tests of his life in Gethsemane, was in anguish and sorrow, prayed that God will take the cup of suffering. Yet he said those very powerful words that humanity can find hope for and can find guide when facing the greatest test of their life. He said, yet I want your will to be done, not, not mine. He said, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Church, pain and suffering will end as God's promise. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. God showed a vision to prophet Jeremiah about God's restoration of God's people. And there is a beautiful picture of God's deliverance amidst difficulty and troubles. Being a pastor, living and responding to the current situations, there are many days that I feel emotionally, mentally, physically, and sometimes spiritually exhausted drained, looking for his strength. I asked God when this would end, especially the crisis that we are facing. We want to be together in church again. We want our church members to go back to the rhythm of life. But it seems there is no solution inside. Then I came across to this passage and it gave me hope and strength. Again in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11, and 12. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Jeremiah saw a vision of an almond tree. Almond tree blossoms before it leaves, its leaves appear and usually blossoms so early. It is illustrative of haste and urgency. Jeremiah saw a branch of an almond in which it illustrates God's action. God said, as you have seen an almond branch, I am ready to fulfill my word. I am ready to perform deliverance as what I promise. Church, we still do not know the timeline when God's actual deliverance from pain and suffering would be. God doesn't give us the calendar on when He would end our suffering or pain or troubles, our sickness. Even His coming, we do not know. But we know, we know God without an ounce of doubt. And we exactly know His words and His promises. Claim it today. He is ready to perform His word of deliverance. There are many things in life to thank God of. Yes, there are happy life. There are moments of being happy, happy marriage, a healthy life, a good job, living in a good home, to be part of a loving church, be in a good community. Some of you, you raise your children and now have their own lives living in the way you envisioned them to be. Yet, even in happiness, there is sorrow. Suffering and troubles and sometimes fear and anxiety are real expressions of our human vulnerability, having been lack of human strengths of our own to cope with all those problems. We don't have powers to overcome those. Yet, a true Christian's story does not end in defeat and struggle. It does not end in worry and fear. So, I admonish you, if you are facing troubles, pains, fear in life, keep carrying your cross. Keep carrying your cross and exchange it someday with a crown. God will end our suffering someday and He is there. He will quench all of our suffering. 
And He is always there to help us in due time. So in hardships, pains, sorrow, troubles, let us learn to say with confidence in God. Like Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. God bless you all. Amen. So